All right, we can get started. So welcome back and also thank you for coming. So please, by the way, just uh, for some practical reasons, the Madame Secretaire General needs to get in contact with the delegations. Actually, she would like to send emails to each and every one member of the delegations, but since uh, she doesn't have this email list and since not every single member of the delegations show up on uh, at least today, she doesn't have this occasion to get their emails. But uh, that will be still practical if the heads of delegations uh, just write down on a piece of paper, which I believe is being now circulated, please put your name and a country's name and your email address so that uh, Chala could get in contact with you in due course because you will, I mean, the delegations will uh, keep getting messages from the UN Secretary General, all right? So this is an important thing. Uh, and other than that, there will be another list, uh, attendance list, actually attendance uh, paper that will be circulated. I don't know whether it is circulated already. Now it's there. Gurjian is writing her name. Passes to her left. So uh, again, thank you for coming on such a short notice. I was supposed to be in Cairo right now attending a meeting. Well, that would be nice, fine on the Nile, Fairmont Hotel, pretty chic place. Well, I've been there, uh, no big deal. But I had reason for canceling my participation, uh, although it was an important meeting, but I had some other important things to do here, and just like teaching today, and seeing your smiling faces, and I hope you think likewise. All right, so uh, we had started talking about um, the situation in Iraq. I mean, we have covered all the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And with, of course, uh, not every single uh, event that uh, has taken place. I mean, this is not a course on history, as I always repeat. Um, but major developments uh, starting from the 40s and 50s all through the 60s and 70s have been covered. And you should be able to at least make an analysis of the situation if and when it is so required. So um, now we have come to the 1990s. And as I said, and you also uh, said that two major developments have shaken the foundations of international <coughs> system. One was, of course, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, which uh, later on turned into uh, a call for intervention into the region by mainly the United States and the coalition powers. And soon later, soon after that, there was uh, another groundbreaking development, which was the collapse of the Soviet Union. So all these developments have, of course, uh, forced countries in the region and in the entire world to revise their foreign and security policies, to uh, adjust a, a, their uh, priorities, adapt themselves to the new developments, because some of the alliances just disappear, just like the Warsaw Pact, as soon uh, as uh, sort of as early as the late 1990s, late 1980s, 8990 Warsaw Pact just disappear, and we have also witnessed uh, in another part of the world again uh, the reunification of uh, the two Germanys and separation of Czechoslovakia as Czech Republic and Slovak Slovakia. So these were important developments, as I said, and the disintegration of the Soviet Union had many consequences and implications for the rest of the world, not in the political uh, sense only, but also, and maybe more specifically from our perspective, was uh, the implications for the security of the region and the entire world, because the former Soviet Union was the biggest, the largest uh, weapons arsenal of all sorts. Chemical weapons, biological weapons, nuclear weapons, tens of thousands of them, or tens of thousands of tons, hundreds of kilograms of biological agents and tons of uh, chemical agents, etc. So that was the biggest arsenal. Now, I mean, when collapsed, the Soviet authority on top of them sort of were uh, left to their own devices, and th that was a pretty scary situation that required a number of measures, some of which were hopefully taken uh, abruptly just uh, on time, but still uh, the huge 
uh, Soviet arsenal uh, was very difficult to contain from passing into the hands of uh, a number of states which were aspiring to such weapons as well as non-state actors which were abundant in the Middle East especially and also in other parts of the world. So the, uh, the two major developments that I mentioned had severe consequences for a number of countries, one of which of course was and still is and probably in the foreseeable future will be Turkey. And we will also look at this situation from Turkey's perspective as to what happened, for instance, in Iraq and how these uh, developments have uh, affected Turkey's foreign and security policies back in the 1990s and uh, the early 90s, 2000s and today and what do we see on the horizon as coming in terms of dangers, challenges, risks, threats uh, and not only for Turkey, of course, for all the countries in the region. Um, Actually, there is uh, a reading in your reading list uh, from uh, United Nations publications, National Threat Perceptions in the Middle East. This study was conducted back in mid-1990s. And you, you, there you can see reactions, of course, uh, given by scholars and experts or people who work uh, for their governments in the, in the region, reactions from Syria, Jordan, Israel, uh, Egypt, uh, and Saudi Arabia. So, that, that is a compilation of how the developments in the, in the region, uh, and specifically, particularly in the Middle East, uh, because of Iraqi situation, and also the consequence of the collapse of the Soviet Empire, which was one of the major poles. I mean, because the whole international system rested upon this bipolarity during the Cold War years for a number of decades. So it was not an easy thing for all the countries to adjust their foreign policies all of a sudden to these changing circumstances with the disappearance of one of the poles, which actually uh, uh, was very instrumental in uh, or for some countries uh, just to see this, uh, this pole, I mean the Soviet Union, as a major uh, sort of support for their foreign policies. For instance, Syria, Iraq. I mean, as we mentioned, uh, when we talk about the 1970s and 80s, we mentioned uh, the role of the Soviet Union in not only wars such as Yom Kippur, uh, you remember the Soviet Union threatened Israel uh, with retaliation in kind if Israel really decided to use its nuclear weapons capability. And, and if, if Israel attacked Egypt, uh, Syria with nuclear weapons or other countries with nuclear weapons, <coughs> Russia threatened Israel with uh, doing the same to Israel. Of course, that will be, uh, these were far-fetched scenarios. I mean, that would, or maybe they did not have any practicality, but of course, as a matter of politics. And deterrence is one major uh, sort of a strategy in, in, in uh, uh, sort of uh, achieving your goals without military confrontation. I mean, because military confrontation means, of course, loss of lives and huge damage, destruction, loss of money and everything. So you have to rebuild many things. Uh, therefore, uh, what was, of course, uh, important in, in the 70s and 80s, the role the Soviet Union played for uh, the Syria and Iraq, because that, that was maybe not in the sense that we have seen you know, in, 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 the, in Central and Eastern Europe in terms of Warsaw uh, Pact, but this alliance could uh, be no, of no less importance, no less significance for Middle East politics. I mean, the, the alliance relationship between Soviet Union, Syria, and Iraq. And with the disappearance of the Soviet Union, of course, and with uh, Iraqi situation, when Iraq invaded Kuwait, we talk about here all these developments, starting with uh, United Nations Security Council you know, convening an emergency meeting, just like the one that you will be uh, sort of uh, having here, of course not uh, as UN Security Council body, but as a separate sort of uh, a gathering. Anyway, uh, we have seen the reaction of the United Nations Security Council by way of uh, uh, issuing a number of warnings to Iraq in order to withdraw its troops from Kuwait with a view to restoring the uh, peace and stability in the region. But uh, that was, of course, uh, not very uh, uh, feasible from Iraqi perspective because probably Saddam Hussein had certain things in mind which he thought he could achieve. Maybe 
uh, he wanted to take advantage of some of the developments which had already started to take place um, uh, in Central Eastern Europe, and uh, I mean, which paved the way to the collapse of the Warsaw Pact. And maybe he thought the war would be so involved in other things that you know they, they could uh, they could uh, overlook uh, as to what was happening in Iraq. But that was absolutely not the situation, and the, the contrary happened, and the whole world confined its attention to the situation in Kuwait, Iraq, and, and therefore this uh, war uh, started, I mean, after a number of developments that we mentioned here. So therefore this, these are all important things, uh, and when we talk about Iraqi situation here, we should not think of this as if it's a matter, it's a problem of one country only. No, I mean, yes, of course, what happened in Iraq, uh, of course, was very, very important. Many hundreds of thousands of people, civilian, women, children, children, elderly, I mean, lost their lives, not because of war itself, but because of the sanctions which were applied on Iraq. And yes, the United Nations uh, system or the charter requires a country to be subject to sanctions if and when that country's leadership did not comply with the established norms and principles or do not pay attention to the warnings of the international community. So these sanctions were not imposed on Iraq just for fun. I mean, they, nobody imposed impose sanctions on other country or sort of uh, support or complies with the, this kind of sanctions just to uh, you know, uh, have fun because uh, sanctions, me personally, I really don't believe very much uh, in the merit of sanctions. And we have seen a number of examples, not only here in Iraq, but also in other parts of the world. Yes, I mean, this is an instrument that needs to be calibrated uh, carefully. And there is therefore this term smart sanctions. I don't know how smart they can be. But all in all, what we have seen, what the world has seen uh, all through these years since 1991 and onwards, up until the Second War in Iraq in 2003, within a span of like 12 years, uh, according to different uh, sources, there are, you know, the figures vary. And we don't have an exact number, or we don't have a number that could be absolutely 100% verified, but yet we have to trust in the studies conducted by a number of uh, uh, institutions, uh, by a number of uh, think tanks or resource centers, uh, which are independent or to the extent possible independent. And there is this talk of 1.5 million people, one and a half million people have lost their lives or have been severely affected from sanctions, especially the children, because uh, the sanctions uh, encompass almost every single item that one would have to use for his daily uh, uh, diet, or and like uh, milk powder, for instance, uh, was sanctioned because, well, th there could be some secondary, tertiary sort of applications of uh, some of the substances in the milk powder for some other stuff with maybe chemical, biological related issues. Well, if you are so suspicious about every <coughs> single ingredient of every single material, um, then you put sanctions and you think you put your mind at ease and thinking that these sanctions would not affect anybody's life. No, that was absolutely not the situation. As I said, almost the exact opposite has happened and people did not ha have access to medication, did not have access to uh, other uh, important uh, things that they would need in their lives and therefore the, the, their living standards, which actually were not at all in good shape anyway, uh, even before the war, uh, the, their living standard de deteriorated after the sanctions. So, I mean, this is something that uh, uh, just like small you know, bits and pieces about the situation uh, in Iraq, but what matters from our perspective, of course, is first of all, what happened in Iraq, and then what happened in Iraq, how these things that have happened in Iraq affected uh, the neighboring countries and the greater region, because there is this talk of greater Middle East, which I believe makes sense to some extent, not, not entirely, 
and also implications for the rest of the world in terms of um, perceptions of ordinary citizen in, in any part of the world. Because when we talk about today, I mean, I'm going to go back to Iraq, but just to open a parenthesis here as to why applications uh, or the policies that were pursued vis-a-vis -vis Iraqi situation by a number of countries, you know, uh, matter uh, uh, for, you know, even today's situation. For instance, for reasons that we will elaborate in a moment, uh, the situation with respect to um, the, you know, weapons of mass destruction arsenal of Iraq was, according to many, was somewhat exaggerated. And this exaggeration now and then, of course, caused a number of uh, concerns, uh, misgivings uh, in many parts of the world. And today, when uh, a number of countries again put forward certain allegations with respect to Iran's nuclear program or nuclear capabilities, people make direct references to the situation in Iraq and say, look, you exaggerated the situation back then in uh, 91 or 2003 in order to invade Iraqi territory. Now you are exaggerating the situation again purposefully to invade Iran or to do something to Iran. So therefore, I don't trust your allegations. I don't buy them. I don't agree with you. And I'm not with you. So, and this is, this is so from the bottom in the street, men in the street to the top leadership even in, in this country or in other countries in the world, when it comes to taking decisions, of course, countries' decisions, even in the UN platform, may be affected from this kind of perceptions, which have been, of course, somehow um, manipulated uh, with uh, some of the information whose veracity uh, uh, sort of uh, was contested, and some of them were uh, proven to be wrong. So this is therefore important, and therefore, when, we, when you listen to me with respect to Iraqi situation, you should understand that it is not only Iraq that we are concerned here, but uh, the implications of what happened in Iraq for the rest of the region. Of course, for Turkey, for Syria, for Iran, for Saudi Arabia, for Jordan, for Palestine, for Israel. So, um, I mean, it is, there are countless number of troubles in the Middle East. So, uh, maybe you need a two or three semester course to cover all of them uh, in a meaningful manner. So um, let me just uh, get a drop of coffee. And in the meantime, if you think of any questions that you may have or any, any point that needs to be clarified. All right. Um, let's remember what we have talked about. And I can't see any board markers around. As well, well, just doesn't matter. Don't worry. We can get grab one from the break. Each time we leave here, but somebody takes away anyway. So remember uh, this: the resolution 687, which was uh, adopted by the United Nations Security Council on, I guess, 3rd of April. Yeah, April 3rd, 1991, Resolution 687. And if you would remember, we talk about a number of paragraphs in this resolution, which, when compared to others, uh, make more sense and explain the situation as to what was coming. And there is because. Uh, remember, some of you may have to work for United Nations in the future or for Turkish uh, foreign delegations, I mean, uh, foreign ministry. Uh, if you enter the foreign ministry, you may be part of the delegations in meetings. So one of the first things that you do with the resolutions, you go straightly, uh, of course, the entry, the preambular paragraphs, but also to the paragraphs which start with the sites and also to some issues uh, which may give you hints about what is, what, what is coming after the resolution with respect to uh, the situation in the short term, medium term, and longer term. So um, this, the paragraph 33, uh, just to remind you, and I believe you have this 
you have access to uh, the internet, then you can just, by going to the UN website and choosing this uh, peace and security domain, then you go to Security Council, then you go to Resolutions, then you go to 1991, and pick up Resolution 687. Um, you, you can see here uh, the, the declaration of a ceasefire. And I explained the situation on a couple of occasions that ceasefire is an interim solution. It doesn't put an end to war in terms of uh, achieving a peace, a final and ultimate. It's not an ultimate uh, uh, measure. It is an interim measure which puts a halt to fightings, to skirmishes, to uh, losses of uh, lives and damage and destruction which uh, enables the parties to find a political solution by way of mediation, by way of, uh, I don't know, uh, taking certain steps in order to improve the situation or to correct some of the mistakes uh, parties may have committed. So what was the mistake that Iraq committed? I mean, one major mistake was, of course, invasion of a neighboring country which was, of course, totally unacceptable from the international law perspective. Inviolability of borders. No country can cross the borders of another country and enter into the territory uh, without, of course, permission coming from that country for some specific reason. Um, and there are not so many examples. Well, um, sometimes, in some countries, uh, the existing regime may be toppled down by a rebel group or by some other you know, parts in political factions. And some new people may come to the leadership and may ask from another country to come to their territory to help with the new regime, to consolidate the position of the new regime vis-a-vis -vis the other parties that they have toppled already. Can you think of one example? Well, we have not covered this specific issue here, but of course your ages uh, um, are not sufficient enough to remember that something like that because most of you are probably not born yet. But uh, yes? Exactly, that is the situation. Afghanistan, uh, Babra Karmal and, you know, comes to power and then he invites the Soviet Union to you know, put things in order but, and in, that was in 1979. And, of course, they had to leave the country after about a decade and uh, in a very miserable uh, condition. All right, so uh, this uh, one particular mistake that Iraq did, and that was basically the reason why the United Nations system reacted to Iraq and paid the way to this war, finally to this resolution, which declared a ceasefire. And Iraq was found guilty, quote unquote, not only for uh, viola violating the sovereignty of Kuwait or invading the Kuwaiti territory. I Iraq was found guilty also for having done certain things in the past without, of course, being caught with impunity. And therefore, now that they are in a weak position, not at their country, uh, is under the pressure of the international community, the international community thought it would be the best time and it would be appropriate if they also corrected, um, if they corrected the uh, uh, situation uh, with respect to some of the uh, mistakes that Iraq committed in the past or some of the violations of its international commitments. What were these international commitments? Iraq was found guilty, I mean, at least the jury decided so as such. Uh, Iraq was found guilty for violating its um, obligations under the, uh, the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, or the NPT, the Non-Proliferation, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Iraq was believed to have done certain things wrong, uh, and uh, Iraq was believed by many, not everybody, but by many, to have uh, violated its obligations or to have abused the situation, abused some of its rights uh, that were given to him uh, by way of the MPT and by conducting a secret nuclear weapons program. Again, 
Iraq was found guilty, even though they were not member, they were not state, a state party to the Biological Weapons Convention. Iraq was found guilty again. I, when I say guilty, quote unquote, there is no such an you know, international court you know, filing or giving a verdict. But uh, I'm trying to sort of uh, explain the situation here for doing research as well as uh, manufacturing biological weapons and also uh, extensively uh, 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 both producing and also using chemical weapons. So, and also developing ballistic missiles, which all together uh, uh, pose a big challenge, a big threat for its neighbors and for the world. And Iraq also was uh, believed to have some connections with uh, some non-state actors um, in some parts of the world, which actually an, an argument was further elaborated or um, used by the United States as a, uh, as a reason, as a justification for U.S.'s entry into war and entry into, into the Iraqi territory for invasion. And it is still pretty much the case. Yes, uh, a number, a large number of uh, American troops have been withdrawn right now, but not all of them. And even if all of them are withdrawn, uh, there will still be influence of the United States for the foreseeable future in the governance of the new regime in Iraq. But all in all, because of this, the, the ceasefire here, which put an end to the fightings, uh, this ceasefire required the correction of Iraq. You know, there is this, uh, in the United States, must be seen in movies, there is this Department of Corrections. When, people, when they put people in, in jail, they think they correct them. So if we construct an analogy, um, uh, you know, Iraq being you know, under Saddam Hussein, not today, being a guilty person who is uh, who's, you know, going to be put in prison, needs to be corrected, and therefore the uh, mistakes that Iraq has committed so far were supposed to be corrected by way of imposing not only sanctions but also uh, applying some measures that would include uh, destruction, removal, or rendering harms of its weapons of mass destruction capability as well as ballistic missiles. And of course, ballistic missiles are part of weapons of mass destruction capability because whatever chemical, biological, or nuclear weapon or warhead you may develop, you need a delivery vehicle and ballistic missiles are uh, delivery vehicles for such weapons. So, uh, um, therefore, the purpose of this resolution, and specifically, the purpose of this paragraph, was uh, uh, putting an end to fightings which could uh, cause uh, or claim the lives of many more people, and uh, you know, cleansing Iraqi. Uh, Iraq or Iraqi territory from its existing weapons of mass destruction capability so that it doesn't create, it doesn't constitute any more a challenge, a threat for its neighbors. So, therefore, this ceasefire was made conditioned upon a number of uh, issues, as has been stated here, uh, about provisions, and we mentioned rather briefly before we ended the class uh, last Friday that specifically paragraphs number 8, 9, and 10 are significant. Here you can see the United Nations Security Council, it says, um, decides that Iraq shall unconditionally accept the destruction, removal, or rendering, rendering harmless of its uh, of course, under international cooperation of all chemical, biological weapons and all stocks of agents and all related subsystems and components and all research developed in support of manufacturing facilities related to uh, as, um, and ballistic missiles with a range. We talk about the, the reason and the United Nations Security Council, although on the one hand decided to uh, dismember uh, in terms of its major capabilities, or to, to uh, uh, destroy, remove, or render harmless the weapons of mass destruction capabilities of Iraq so that it doesn't uh, uh, create any further, doesn't constitute any threat for its neighbors, but also 
the same council did not want Iraq to be uh, sort of uh, a target of its neighbors and to remain at least a minimum deterrent in, in Iraq so that uh, its neighbors uh, would not even dare thinking about invading Iraq when it was un, in a very vulnerable situation because of the war, because of sanctions, and also, also because of all these uh, applications of some of the uh, uh, inspections, things like that. So therefore, uh, the ANSCOM, uh, the United Nations Spe Special Commission, and the IAEA were mandated with this task. ANSCOM was given the specific task with respect uh, of destroying, removing, or rendering harmless of chemical, biological weapons, and ballistic missiles. And the IAEA was given the task of uh, uh, doing the same for its nuclear infrastructure. Hopefully, and it was so discovered anyway, and many people believed already, that Iraq did not have nuclear weapons by the time of war, nor would it have any such capability uh, anytime soon. Because uh, in the late 80s and early 1990s, even before Iraq invaded Kuwait, um, Iraq was uh, pronounced as one of the countries that would soon acquire nuclear weapons capability. Many people in, the, in academia and in, in you know, uh, international security circles believed uh, some of the reports projecting uh, or suggesting that Iraq might acquire nuclear weapons capability by the mid or early 1990s. So in 88, 89, there are some reports suggesting that Iraq could very well develop nuclear weapons by 93, 95. So uh, there were some people who really believed in that. And of course, it is not that easy. Well, today we can say uh, what happened, in, knowing that what happened in the past, what was true, what was not, now we, we can make comments. But back in the late 1980s, when the world was still uh, divided as East and West, though it, you know, we were coming to an end, and the Soviet Union was losing its power every single day, but still uh, this perception about Iraqi situation or the situation in the Middle East uh, was pretty much um, exaggerated, but there were reasons for some people to believe that Iraq could very well develop nuclear weapons uh, not into a distant future. That means early 1990s. But when the IAEA went to Iraq, and IAEA inspectors and went to Iraq and went to the uh, facilities that were uh, associated with the uh, nuclear program, civilian and military, they have seen that Iraq did, of course, uh, do uh, a number of things for deviating from uh, the mainstream uh, exploitation of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes, but rather they were uh, uh, aiming at developing nuclear weapons. There was this infrastructure, but the scientists, technicians uh, within the body of the IAEA have figured out that that was uh, not such an elaborate or sophisticated infrastructure that would allow Iraq to become a nuclear weapon capable state in a short time. So some of the Inspectors who have taken uh, part of uh, part in this uh, inspection uh, missions because they have gone to Iraq, they have gone to enter these facilities. They had all their time to look into every single aspect of the nuclear program of Iraq, and they could then figure out that well, Iraq did a lot of things and spent a lot of money in the infrastructure as well as in uh, in scientific technological issues, instruments, and you know, bringing in people from different countries, scientists, uh, technicians. But Iraq was quite far from assembling a nuclear device in the foreseeable future. So therefore, the nuclear infrastructure was not that difficult to deal with. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, the IAEA wrapped up its job and its mandate finished its job by 1995 or so. I mean, of course, from 90, 1991 uh, April and soon after inspection, inspectors have started to come to Iraq, ANSCOM as well as IAEA. And within like a period of like um, four years, 
uh, the nuclear infrastructure was uh, uh, signed and sealed as being clean. So nothing was left. And they either uh, have withdrawn some of the material, some of the uh, major components. They destroyed some of the facilities. So they uh, actually, the IAEA made the Iraqi nuclear infrastructure unusable for weapons purposes, period. So they finished their job, signed and sealed the document, and they've gone on. So actually, from 95 onwards, I might be a little bit uh, you know, mistaken with days, but I, as far as I remember, that was 95 that when they finished their job and they went back home. And from then onwards, although Iraq was still uh, under sanctions, and Iraq, uh, as you should remember, the north and south no-fly zones, the Kurdish part and the Shiite part in the south and in the north. Um, so, but in, the, in between the two no-fly zones, Saddam still had its authority. And, and again, I am telling you this uh, based on my conversations with a number of inspectors and friends uh, or you know, people whom I met on different occasions in different forums uh, who had spent some time in the inspection missions that there were some doubts uh, in, in, in their minds uh, about Iraq still being capable or able to maintain a certain network of procurement of not only uh, some weapons or some weapons related material, but also they were trying to resuscitate the nuclear program. Well, I don't know what Saddam Hussein had in mind as to how he could really trust or believe that he would be able to revive its nuclear program after all this destruction, physical destruction, and removal of some of the material that would be uh, indispensable for weapons purposes. But maybe, he, even if he didn't believe, or maybe he believed truly, uh, even if he didn't believe, he might have wanted to give an image to his own people that he was still in power, that he could do um, you know, things that you know, uh, he was still the dictator, and he was still the one man, the man who was governing the country. Well, we, we, of course, under such circumstances, the psyche of people might, might uh, cause them to do certain things that may, may not be uh, meaningful from uh, our perspective. So Iraqi nuclear infrastructure was out of question, especially after the IEA finished the job. And that was not the part of story that was further uh, in, uh, later on, after that, a certain point, was subject to a lot of controversy, a lot of criticism. What was subject to controversy and criticism debate was the job of ANSCOM, ANSCOM United Nations Special Commission in Iraq. Not, uh, of course, for things that ANSCOM has done and also for things that ANSCOM failed to do or was not able to accomplish. And uh, it was, uh, for every single reason, they were at the center of uh, uh, criticism and all the, under the stage lights. All right, let's give a break. And after the break, we'll continue with uh, the story of Oscar.